Welcome to the Gold Mining Camp Museum at Monroe Park. My name is Todd Bontrair and I'm the manager and curator of the museum, which is a part of the Fauquier County Parks and Recreation Department. In the 1990s, HP and Thelma Monroe donated the land for the park. You will be hearing from Thelma a little later in this video. The mission of the museum is to tell the gold mining history of the county and Virginia and to show what life was like in an area gold mine in the 1930s. For nearly 150 years, between 1800 and 1947, mines operated in Fauquier County and other nearby areas, such as Stafford, Culpeper, Spotsylvania, Orange, and Louisa counties, and in many other parts of the state. The Virginia Gold Belt runs southwest from the Potomac River west of Washington, D.C., down to the North Carolina border, with the majority of mining occurring in a line between Goldvein and Buckingham County. From more than 260 mines statewide, over 98,000 ounces of gold was sent to the United States Mint, although we do not know exactly how much was taken out of the ground. Between 1800 and 1940, up to 19 gold mines operated in the southern end of Fauquier County. Since the mining belt runs through rural areas, the companies built camps for the miners, who often were not from the local area. The companies would have to provide the miners with a place to eat, a mess hall, a place to sleep, a bunkhouse, and a space to examine and process the ore brought in, an assay office. Since very few buildings remain at the old mines, our museum buildings are modern recreations. The first reference to gold being found in Virginia was in 1782 in Thomas Jefferson's Notes on the State of Virginia. He wrote he knew of a single instance of gold found in the state. It was interspersed in small specks through a lump of ore of about four pounds weight, which yielded 17 pennyweight of gold. This ore was found on the north side of Rappahannock, about four miles below the falls. This was nearly an ounce of gold, as there are 20 pennyweight in an ounce. In 1799, outside of Charlotte, North Carolina, a 12-year-old boy named Conrad Reed found a 17-pound nugget of gold while he was walking along a stream on his family's farm. And in 1803, the family began a placer mine. It seems possible that people in Virginia heard about this discovery and decided to look in their own streams, maybe remembering what Thomas Jefferson wrote 20 years before. The earliest mining operations in Fauquier County and Virginia were also placer mines, where workers would remove the gold found in the sands of the streams and rivers. This was not an expensive process. The mine owner only needed to pay for the labor and relatively little equipment. Once this gold ran out, the miners would start looking on the land for outcroppings of quartz. In Virginia, gold is found in veins of quartz inside the bedrock. So the miners started digging out the weakened, weathered quartz on the surface in what is called load mining. Eventually, access shafts, sometimes as deep as 350 feet, were dug into the ground to access the gold-bearing quartz. Let's go visit the assay office. Welcome to the assay office. The assayer was a very important person at the mine. He was trained to test the minerals in the quartz ore, such as this, found at the site using acids and other chemicals to determine if it contained precious materials, such as gold or silver, or whether the materials were iron, pyrite, or mica. Once it was determined where on the site gold could be found, then the real work would begin. As mentioned before, at the early placer mines, workers sifted the gold from the sands in streams or in rivers using sluices or other devices. Gold is very dense. It is very heavy for its size. 19 times as dense as water and 7 times as dense as quartz. Due to its density, the gold flakes settle in the low spots behind the riffles of the pan or the sluice while water running through the sluice washed the lighter sands away. To increase efficiency, mercury, also known as quicksilver, was added to create an amalgam with the gold. Mercury is one of the few elements that will react with the inert gold. It has a near magnetic attraction with gold. It is easier to separate this amalgam from the remaining sand rather than picking out each small piece of gold. 
Miners would also excavate the ore from the surface or near the surface in what is called load mining. When ore was dug out of the ground, it needed to be crushed and pulverized to the size of table salt, either by hand or mechanically. Stamp mills with piston-like stamps and heavy weights were a common machine used to crush the ore in Virginia. Once again, the gold was consolidated using mercury to create an amalgam, leaving the other lighter materials to be washed away. The assayer would then separate the gold and mercury by heating the amalgam until the mercury turned into a vapor, leaving the gold behind, and the mercury vapor was recollected for use at a later time. The leftover sponge gold needed to be smelted or purified. Assayers melted the sponge gold in ceramic cups or crucibles. As the gold melted, solid impurities floated to the top and could be skimmed off. The melted gold was then poured into molds, making either gold bars or buttons to be sent off-site. Around 1890, sodium cyanide started to be used to process ores that contained iron pyrite. This process made it more economically feasible to reopen some of the old depleted mines. Because of this, many mines in Virginia did reopen in the late 1800s. Several mines operated in Fauquier County after 1900, and a few were running in the 1930s during the Great Depression most notably the Liberty and Franklin mines. But because of the costs associated with mining and low gold output, these mines all shut down by 1940. In the late 1930s, after getting off the bus from Bealton High School, Thelma Edwards and two friends visited the Franklin mine and convinced the miners to lower them into the mine shaft in a great big old bucket. They were lowered all the way to the bottom, nearly 350 feet. Because they went so deep, the groundwater had to be continuously pumped out. Miss Edwards, soon to be Mrs. Monroe, said the water running down the walls and the gold in the veins were the most beautiful sights she had ever seen. Let's go visit the mess hall. Welcome back to the mess hall. This was an important building since it is where the miners ate their meals and most likely spent some of their free time. In the 1930s, Southern Fauquier was very rural. Once a miner found his way to the gold mines, he probably would not have traveled very far from it. Therefore, it was important for the mining camp to provide the necessities of life. Using period objects, our replica mess hall gives one a feel for the time. Very few artifacts from the mines, other than machinery parts and bottles, are typically found at old mine sites. So the items here are period pieces found elsewhere. Let's head on over to the bunkhouse. Alrighty, here we are in the bunkhouse. This is where the miners who did not live nearby would have slept and spent much of their free time. Now, life was very different back in the early 20th century. The buildings at a mine would not have had all the modern conveniences that we are used to today. So, Let's talk about what some of those differences would be. For one, the rural electric cooperatives did not form until right about the time the mine shut down. A mine might have had a generator to produce electricity, but most power would have been used to run machinery. Oil and kerosene lanterns and candles would have been used to light the buildings up at night. Also, air conditioning was not in widespread use at the time, so in the middle of the summer, the buildings would not have been a comfortable temperature for us and a stove like this would have been used to heat the buildings at night and during the winter. Television and computers had not been invented. Instead, a radio would have been the way the miners would have listened to news, music, sporting events, and radio dramas. The miners might have even brought musical instruments like these with them to help pass the time. Nowadays, everyone carries a phone with them, but back in the 1930s, a rural mine probably would have only had one phone for the whole site. There was typically no indoor plumbing, so a miner might not have taken a bath every day like we are used to. The bathrooms would have been an outhouse or a privy, so if you needed to go in the middle of the night in December or January, it would have been a little colder than what we expect. Of course, mining could be a dangerous occupation. In October 1934, Lawrence Showalter was being lowered into a shaft at the Franklin mine when the cable broke, causing him to fall 50 feet and land in water at the bottom of the shaft, 150 feet from the top. 
his arm and leg were broken, and he showed signs of a skull fracture. And that will do it for our tour of the buildings. Thank you for watching this video. I hope you learned something about gold mining in general, and specifically gold mining in Fauquier County and Virginia. We would love to see you at the museum soon. Our hours are Wednesday through Saturday, 9.30 a.m. to 5 p.m. and on Sunday, noon to 4 p.m. Or for more information, you can visit the museum's website at www.goldvein.com. Once again, thank you for watching the video and we hope to see you soon at the Gold Mining Camp Museum and Monroe Park.